we've assembled uh, three extraordinary um, experts in the matter of influence operation and other efforts to uh, uh, devise and insinuate hostile ideologies um, with a view to talking both about the Soviet Union, our experience with it, and how it has helped shape, uh, that is to say, the Soviet Union and our experience with it, has helped to shape the uh, efforts now being made that were the subject of a conversation we had in this room four weeks or so ago uh, with another distinguished panel, Andy McCarthy, uh, National Review Online, former federal prosecutor, um, Amanda Zand Irvin, an Iranian expat uh, and leader of the anti-regime movement in the United States, and uh, Fred Grandy, former member of Congress, uh, now with the Center for Security Policy, who uh, joined us to discuss the Muslim Brotherhood and the role that it specifically is playing at the moment, uh, abroad but particularly here in the form of what uh, it calls civilization jihad. And uh, I think in the course of the day we will be um, finding uh, some of the important uh, roots, if not in the uh, ideological sense, certainly in the tradecraft sense, uh, from which this threat to our country, to uh, the free world more generally, uh, has emanated. Um, I'd like to ask, if I may, uh, each of you to introduce yourselves before I introduce our guests so that they know to whom they're speaking, and um, we welcome you all. Start with you. Thank you. Andrew Barris, I'm with the Office of Congressman Tom Price and the Republican Policy Committee. Preston Knoll, Tradition, Family, and Property. Mark Solinsky, U.S. Army Counterintelligence. Bob Morrison, Family Research Council. Uh, Terry Camp, I'm an attorney in private practice, but used to work in the Soviet Union. Natalia Manunsova, and I'm visiting here, so. Uh, Peter Lejeune, International Institute for Nonproliferation Studies. Gary Massena with the Institute. Peter Tay, Institute of World Politics, graduate student. Mike Waller, professor at the Institute and also with the Center. Daniel Kettinger, an intern at the Heritage Foundation. David Boyce, Center for Security Policy. I'm Francis Caroline Lane, an independent national security analyst. Kyle Scheidler, Endowment for Middle East Truth. Betty Hawkins, espionage nerd. Tommy Sears, Center for Security Policy and Center for Military Readiness. Tim Baldwin, Westminster Institute, also a student at the Institute of World Politics. Andrew Delvecchio recently started the No Sharia Law in America project. Katie Gorka, Westminster Institute. Sebastian Gorka, I teach you regular warfare. Ginny Thomas with Liberty Consulting and Daily Caller. Constance Bardos with the office of Congressman Randy Holkren. Katie Brookins also with Congressman Holkren's office. Uh, Steve Lukasik, and I'm a proxy for Fritz Ermoth this morning, who's in Wyoming. <laughs> Sam Sweeney, intern at the Kirby Center here. Wayne Balls, president of the Balls Company, formerly on the staff of uh, Senator Mac Mattingly from 1981 to 82, and then Senator Jesse Helms from 1982 to 2003. Kelvin Freiberger, intern with the Kirby Center. Uh, Todd Leventhal, I work at State Department, a place called the Center for Strategic Counterterrorism Communications. Michael Cheek, Homeland Security. Well, welcome again uh, to you all. Um, I'm Frank Afton with the Center for Security Policy. I'm really pleased to be hosting this, um, as I say, second uh, in a series of programs on influence operations, past and present, um, and what they have been able to accomplish um, at the expense of freedom-loving people in the past, what has been attempted uh, at the very least, and to uh, 
to the extent that this is playing out in real time at the moment, what, uh, what the implications are of influence operations um, for this country and its allies, uh, its vital interests, its security. Uh, let me introduce our speakers um, at once and then each of them will uh, step up in turn to uh, take on different pieces of this story um, of the Soviet practice of influence operations and um, how it bears on our own present circumstance. Uh, Dr. John Lanchowski, uh, the number of you from the Institute of World Politics, uh, this is a Institute of World Politics event in many respects. John is, of course, the founder and president of that highly esteemed institution. Uh, it is, to my way of thinking, um, truly a national treasure in the training of the next generation in statecraft and uh, strategy and public policy in the national security space. And uh, that is in no small measure a function of John's vision and leadership. Um, among other things, which bears directly on our present topic, uh, he served President Reagan as the Director of European, for European and Soviet Affairs at the National Security Council from 1983 to 1987, during which time he was his principal in-house advisor on Soviet affairs. Um, he is uh, highly educated, including a PhD from my alma mater, the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, and the author most recently of several books, uh, most recent one of which is Full Spectrum Diplomacy and Grand Strategy, Reforming the Structure and Culture of U.S. Foreign Policy. I've asked John to give us kind of an overview of uh, Soviet ideology, doctrine, and strategy, and sort of the... the uh, the role that influence operations have played in its practice by the Soviet Union. Secondly, we'll be hearing from Dr. Christopher Harmon. Uh, Christopher Harmon is uh, also a professor, an adjunct professor at uh, the Institute of World Politics, um, a, uh, a professor as well at the Marine Corps University where he holds the Matthew C. Horner Chair for Military Theory, uh, the author of a number of books, including uh, now in its second edition, Terrorism Today, um, a very important text for graduate level studies on the subject. Um, he is also the author of Toward a Grand Strategy Against Terrorism. Um, Christopher will be talking a bit about how the Soviet Union and Warsaw Pact uh, engaged in activities aimed at promoting the Soviet Union's goals, including, among others, uh, influence operations of various kinds. And thirdly, we'll be talking with Dr. Jack Ziak, um, a man who, surprisingly enough, has also taught from time to time uh, at the Institute of World Politics. Um, he is an intelligence professional by training, uh, served in uh, senior capacities both in the intelligence services and um, in the office of the Secretary of Defense. Uh, he is the author of Chikitsi, um, History of the KGB. And uh, Jack will drill down on Soviet practice of uh, influence operations and in particular how it uh, translated into training of the pan-Arab movements, which have in turn done much to uh, equip today's enemies, uh, I guess the anti-secular pan-Arab Islamist movements of today. So um, let me turn the mic over to John uh, Lonchowski to kick things off. And welcome, John. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Frank. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's it's a great pleasure to be here, and and thank you, Frank, for in, including me in this in this panel. I want to uh, just uh, acknowledge the presence of many friends and colleagues in the audience, and uh, uh, and 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 express my uh, appreciation for uh, so many of so much of their work in this field. Um, uh, Frank. Uh, uh, wanted me to touch on overall on Soviet strategy and and the role that influence operations play in it and so to sort of set the stage let's just review that this was a, a, a political system that was run by Marxism Leninism which whether people believed fully in the ideology or not that ideology was operational in the Soviet system 
because it was the sole legitimizing instrument of state authority and, uh, uh, and, and, and legitimacy was a much bigger deal in the Soviet political culture than it is in ours where we take it for granted. Uh, we think the consent of the governed just happens automatically and inheres in nature. Um, the, uh, the Soviets had, to, had an expansionist policy by virtue of the fact that if they didn't expand, if they didn't continue to get con uh, uh, continuing victories and new communist takeovers around the world, uh, then the validity of their ideology uh, could not be ensured. Uh, their ideology required that they expand and so long as they continued to succeed, they would have, uh, they could show that they were indeed rising, riding on the crest of a wave of history, which was an inexorable force that could not be stopped by human will. And uh, a large part of their political strategy was to get people effectively to agree to this. And they actually temporarily succeeded in influencing the American foreign policy establishment during the 1970s who came to agree that, um, the, that we were on the wrong side of history in Central America uh, by supporting the Somosas and the other authoritarian regimes uh, and that therefore, um, uh, and, and, and that there was really nothing we could do to stop this. Uh, and, and this was essentially, this had become uh, a, a, a a kind of a given assumption in, 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 uh, in, in the American foreign policy establishment in the 70s. Um, <clears throat> the Soviets had a strategy of conquest without war, at least in so far as they could minimize war. It was a strategy of protracted conflict. For those of you who don't know the classic book of that title, Protracted Conflict, I heartily recommend it to you. It's one of the greatest books on uh, strategy of, 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 a, of a totalitarian power and how it can advance through uh, various types of political influence operations. The idea of, 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 of this strategy was to avoid a decisive encounter with the enemy, uh, <clears throat> to advance or retreat according to a proper assessment of the correlation of forces. If the, if the enemy was too strong, you stayed put or you even retreated. If the enemy was weak, then you advanced as, as possible. Uh, you attempted to uh, do a strategy of attrition, which would uh, gradually erode the position of the enemy. Uh, it would uh, isolate the enemy so that the, 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 uh, the, 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 first of all, the United States as the main enemy would be isolated from its allies. Anti-communists within the United States would be isolated from other political forces within the country so that uh, all the, the, the real forces capable of mobilizing a coalition of resistance against communism simply could not co properly coalesce. The, uh, this, this strategy of protracted conflict also involved <coughs> the principle of the indirect approach, the indirect attack, where rather than attacking the United States directly, they would uh, attack our, you know, in third areas. Uh, they would attack our allies. They would uh, choose battlefields like Berlin, for example, as a place where uh, our absolute vital national interests may not have been directly at stake, but if they could seize Berlin and, and, and have a, a political victory there, uh, a strategic victory, it would, it would serve this isolation strategy. Um, they would pick different battlefields according to uh, those which were the most propitious. If, if you're a better, uh, better at pistols than at fists or at swords, then you choose pistols. And, and uh, the idea was to choose battlefields that were always propitious One for, for them. One of their battlefields was arms control. Arms control had nothing to do with actually controlling arms. It was, it was, a, it was a battlefield of political warfare, <clears throat> which was designed to uh, affect and influence the publics of the West to put pressure on their governments in order to disarm. Uh, it was an unlevel playing field because the, the, the battle, the, 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 they could affect uh, the Western public, uh, 
as they did in the INF, their anti-INF propaganda campaign in Europe, as they did in the United States when they succeeded in, in, in making the U.S. Congress give them, the Soviets, a veto power over the U.S. MX missile program. The, the Soviets had walked away from the negotiating table. The, the, um, uh, Ronald Reagan asked for 50 MX missiles. Uh, this is after Carter had asked for 100 of them and, and was denied by the Congress. And then the Congress said, uh, well, Mr. President, you can have your 50 MX missiles, but you, you can't have them if the Soviets return to the negotiating table. In other words, they, put, they gave Moscow a veto power over our MX missile program. This was the power that they had because of their peace movement, which had been completely penetrated by communist organizations and, 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 and front organizations and co-opted all sorts of innocent, do-gooding, uh, peace-loving people into, into, their, into their midst. Uh, they succeeded. Uh, the Europeans were the ones who wanted us to deploy intermediate-range nuclear forces. It wasn't an American initiative. It was because the Europeans didn't think that the American nuclear, strategic nuclear umbrella would be, uh, would be sufficiently credible to, de to, to defend Europe. Uh, so they asked us to put in credible uh, deterrent forces, uh, INF forces in Europe, uh, and, and when it came around to actually making the deployments, the Soviets launched a $100 million, uh, uh, a $100 million propaganda campaign which persuaded the, American, uh, the, the European public excuse me, uh, <clears throat> that this was an imperialist American uh, intervention and they practically succeeded in preventing, uh, uh, you know, in getting a number of parliaments in Europe to prevent us from, uh, from, from deploying those forces. We had to ma uh, uh, enact a, a massive counter-propaganda campaign in order to do this. The Soviet strategy, so this was how they would pick their battlefields. We could not get the, the Soviet public to put pressure on the Soviet government to, to control their arms. Um, the, they had all sorts of other operations that were designed uh, for psychological disarmament of the American people. Uh, they, they, had massive cult they had a massive cultural diplomatic offensive under Gorbachev. The Red Army Chorus came to, to, uh, to the Kennedy Center, uh, gave a concert there um, uh, just shortly after they were, they were carpet bombing in Afghanistan, after they had invented and deployed anti-children uh, toy booby traps so that children in the Afghan villages would pick these things up and their arms would be blown off. The idea was to denude the Afghan villages of, of the population so that the Mujahideen uh, resistance could not, uh, uh, could not get local popular su support uh, from, uh, from, from the local villagers. The, the, uh, so here, the, 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 the Red Army Chorus comes to the Kennedy Center and gets a standing ovation from the habitués of, of that estimable institution. Uh, uh, all sorts of other kinds of psychological disarmament uh, operations were being done as, 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 as part of their cultural outreach. They, this, of course, doesn't even get to the, you know, I haven't even touched on the whole question of agents of influence, uh, which is really uh, at the heart of what Frank wants us to get to here, but Frank wanted me to lay out a little bit of the context in which this appeared. The, the, <laughs> The, the Soviets had spies, but one can argue that their agents of influence may have changed the course of history more than any of their spies did. Perhaps if we had gotten in a strategic war the, the, with the Soviets, the, 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 the Walker spy ring alone could have compromised our submarine deterrent uh, and, 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 and that would have been the end of America. But uh, it didn't come to that because that was the nature of, uh, of Soviet strategy not to do uh, an all-out uh, confrontation with the United States. But they had their agents of influence. And, and they, they would put them, try to put them in U.S. government agencies, in the armed forces, in Congress and congressional staffs, in the media, in political campaigns, including financial supporters, in the business community, 
in the labor community and in academic and think tank circles. There are many different kinds of agents. There were paid agents. There were uh, trusted contacts. There were agents who may not have even known that they were agents because they could have been subtly recruited by Soviet case officers uh, with friendly, de develop a friendship, develop a relationship, for example, one journalist to another, and the one journalist will say, you know, the Soviet journalist will say, you know, I, I am really opposed to the arms race. It's a big waste of money. It harms both of our countries. I've really dedicated my life to, to opposing the arms race. Uh, and, and every once in a while, I like to write an article and send it to, to, to Pravda or Izvestia or wherever I'm writing uh, in, in, order to, 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 um, in, in order to oppose this. And then after a few times, he's, he'll say, well, you know, uh, the American journalist with whom he has lunch down at the National Press Club every once in a while will, will say, you know, I kind of agree with you. I think this you know, arms race is really, a, a, you know, a, a pretty bad thing. It's a waste of money. We both got overkill. Uh, we don't need these weapons. Well, you know, and so Yuri will tell Fred, uh, well, why don't, why don't you write an article against the arms race? And Fred says, that's a good idea. I think I'll do that. And, and so he writes it, and, and, and a friendly suggestion, and lo and behold, an article comes out in the American press against the arms race, uh, and, and uh, Fred is now identified, you know, and a few suggestions like this happen over time. A few articles of this kind get written, and, and Fred is listed in the KGB as an agent of influence, and if you put him to a lie detector test, he would, pa he would pass it. He's not working as an agent of influence. He doesn't know it. He's unwitting, and yet that's, that's the story. Um, the uh, various people would work for all sorts of reasons. Some were compromised. Some worked out of fear. Others worked for, uh, out of reasons of ideological compatibility. Some were seduced into it. Uh, personal relationships, even marriage, uh, uh, and, and, and then would, would work. Uh, the, um, they would try to, the, 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 um, I mentioned a variety of targets and strategic locations. Uh, a lot of times, their agents of influence would be placed, you know, obviously if you could get, to get them in high leadership circles or their staffs, it's the best deal. But what they did, particularly, and, and, and this, was, this happened throughout the Cold War, but we have very good records on what happened during World War II era, 1930s, 40s. You had people like Alger Hiss, who started in the Agricultural Adjustment Administration, where a number of communists started out. Others started out at the Works Progress Administration, the National Recovery Administration, the National Labor Relations Board, and then they would move to the Treasury Department, and then perhaps to the State Department. And of course, Alger Hiss ended up sitting at Roosevelt's right hand at, at Yalta. Uh, and, and, and Roosevelt was, of course, influenced by Hiss. He was also influenced by Harry Hopkins, whom our good uh, friend Herb Romerstein uh, learned could very well have been a Soviet agent of influence. Uh, uh, um, Roosevelt's closest advisor who actually lived in the White House with, with the Roosevelts. Um, there were, uh, I wanted to say about one kind of particularly insidious uh, agent of influence of, of a kind, I've witnessed a number of them, I've known a number of them during the Cold War. One of them, a Soviet emigre, ensconced himself in the American think tank world. His job was not to steal secrets. It was to learn the sociology of the policy community. Who's working at Brookings? What's this guy's position on this? What's he going to represent when he becomes Assistant Secretary of State? Who's the guy at Heritage? Who's the guy at AEI? Uh, and, and, and learn all of this. When I got my job, uh, this fellow wrote an article telling, uh, in the public prints telling, uh, telling uh, the, the Kremlin exactly what they needed to know about me. It was spot on, and this is when I got my job in, in the National Security Council. Um, I had, there were, <clears throat> this, this guy never stole a secret, but he was there not only doing, collecting intelligence on, on people, but he was, he, he was insinuating his views about strategic affairs as an expert on these matters uh, into the policy debates. Uh, 
and being remarkably, uh, r remarkably effective. Um, I know of I person, one of my former students was a Soviet agent who worked uh, in, in a classified uh, U.S. government research facility. Another one was a member of Congress who ended up representing uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 this, in this case, Russian organized crime and, and KGB interests without fully knowing that that's what he was doing. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the, there were, anyway, there's the whole story of Stan Levchenko and everything that he did, all of the agents of influence he recruited in, in, in Japan, members of the Japanese diet, uh, working journalists, and by the way, m people in the political opposition, uh, the, the, the editor-in-chief of the largest conservative newspaper in Japan, the, the, the Soviets made a point of, of trying to penetrate the conservative political circles uh, in, in both in the United States and in allied countries. Uh, and th there are all kinds of successes. You know, I, I mentioned the anti-neutron, I mean, excuse me, the anti-INF campaign. There was the anti-neutron bomb campaign, which succeeded. And, and this was, you know, ultimately... Uh, this is where uh, UN Ambassador Andrew Young persuaded President Carter not to deploy the neutron artillery shell, it actually was, not a bomb. Anyway, um, there's so much more, but my time's up. That's Thank you. superb, John. Thank you very much. Chris Harmon. Good morning to you all, and uh, two quick notes. Uh, one is it's fun to be at uh, this building uh, Years ago, when I was out in Claremont, uh, one of the gents who most kindly supported my studies of the subject I'm going to address this morning was Larry Arn. He eventually left the Claremont Institute to become president of Hillsdale. Um, also, there was reference to uh, a book last year toward a grand strategy against terrorism. One of the co-editors, Sebastian Gorka, is here with us uh, today. Um, to follow from what uh, Dr. Lenchowski has been discussing, the influence operations of the USSR and its uh, allies um, seem important uh, for having been developed on many fronts. You know, open diplomacy in places like the United Nations or other bodies, uh, publications from hundreds of presses, uh, financial and covert support uh, to various entities around the world, uh, being able to fund things like the use of literally thousands of Cuban troops in Africa, as in Ethiopia, as in Angola. This all was part of a project that's sourced, as John says, in ideology and also the interests of the states involved in this international uh, partnership. Uh, there was a conviction by the early 1980s that the Soviets were doing so well. They had successfully changed the balance of power or were doing so. And that uh, uh, the sort of victory that uh, John said they felt was ultimate uh, was indeed uh, on its way. There's a Khrushchev speech of January 61 suggesting that and a speech of February 76 suggesting this change in the strategic balance of power. Uh, so all of this is carried on uh, by entities then of the bloc, not just the Kremlin. Um, and the Soviets had, for their part, uh, smart and talented people like the head of the International Department of the Communist Party, Boris Ponomarev, uh, who was widely uh, publicized for his speeches and diplomatic activities around the world and did all he could for many years to support uh, sort of wars of, of national liberation. Um, there is in, in the doctrinal and rhetorical side uh, equal emphasis. These people like Ponomarev were undergirded by an ideological commitment to wars of national liberation and to uh, revolutions abroad in the third world uh, which could advance their mutual communist interests. Uh, and these kinds of, uh, of things were openly discussed by people like Nikita Khrushchev from 1957 on uh, and from Leonid Brezhnev. Uh, Yuri Andropov made speeches as well about the necessity of supporting wars of national liberation and the ways in which such wars would in fact continue to change the balance of power. 
Uh, we know this not just from the overt things, but from the covert things. Uh, there was a meeting in Varna, Bulgaria in the late 60s, and documents were smuggled out later from that. Um, I've closely studied a marvelous uh, 3 May 1979 Stasi document, which was translated by the Marshall Center in Garmisch, uh, which shows an immense amount of contact with uh, members of the so-called Wars of National Liberation. Um, Again, much was available publicly as well as uh, secretly. Uh, the uh, Palestinians' intimate relationship with the Soviet Union and their training in guerrilla warfare and terrorist tactics was reported on in various ways at the time. I recall a Danish newspaper account of 1979 and a very long, important story I have with me today from November of 80. In the New York Times Sunday Magazine, the author was uh, Robert Moss, who today people might remember as a novelist, but the important thing was for a couple of decades, Robert Moss edited the Foreign Report, then owned by The Economist, and it was one of the single best sources on these kinds of international activities by the Soviet bloc. Uh, so when all this became then a question of debate and, and discussion and some ridicule by me media and academic elites in the 80s, actually there was a considerable amount of evidence and overt statements by the Soviets to show exactly what they're doing in supporting international operations. Then, of course, it got more interesting because when the wall falls, these heaps of evidence which had been piling up on the secret side sort of topple over into the West, and people like John Kohler, a very good journalist, does a book in 99 called Stasi, uh, which is one of the many places you can read about all the names and places of the contacts of the people that I'm here to talk about today. Um, there were, uh, to go back to the Palestinians, some most fascinating efforts at influencing emerging third world violent movements. Uh, uh, I recall about 1970 seeing an edition of the Palestinians paper which is called Fata. It had a picture from many years before, the end of the 1950s. This picture showed five or six of the chiefs of uh, the, what later became FATA, the guerrilla army of the Palestine Liberation Army, uh, and uh, uh, a front rather. Uh, and the picture showed them in Bratislava, Czechoslovakia, where they were there for a kind of student leaders conference. Again, this is the, early, the, the late 1950s, as reported in PLO propaganda of about 1970. You can imagine the continuities then in Soviet foreign policy in bringing young men in that sort of picture uh, to uh, Moscow, to East Bloc places for training. Uh, one of the men in that picture was uh, Yasser Arafat, or as he was identified by his nom de guerre, Abu Amar. The caption under the picture related how all these men then broke away after their student conference in Czechoslovakia going on to other East European cities for various other uh, liaisons. Uh, it's a striking example of the beginnings of what later becomes very well known. Uh, for example, in 82 when Israel goes into Lebanon and uh, uh, takes away tons of documents about PLO history and engagement in these kinds of places which had innumerable and close records of their involvement with the East European states. Another interesting part of the project was Yugoslavia, which of course is not uh, fully subordinate to the Soviet bloc, but which had interesting links to it. Uh, well, the only uh, expert I ever knew on the subject uh, was Harold W. Rood, a brilliant professor who died just in October. Uh, but he documented the systematic relations between Yugoslavia and uh, Palestinian forces and other so-called forces of national liberation. Uh, and their Soviet uh, allies at, in certain limited ways. Um, if we turn over to the East German scene, there's uh, considerable evidence about influence operations in that way, both rhetorical uh, and, uh, and in terms of violent uh, measures. Uh, the story can begin, for example, with the magazine published in Berlin called Konkret, uh, K-O-N-K-R-E-T. It was a kind of pro-disarmament magazine. John spoke about these things 
uh, which kind of played up uh, arms control, pacifism, good relations with the Soviet bloc, and also anti-capitalist uh, spirits of various kind. Well, one of the writers for it, and later uh, actually an editor, was Ulrike Meinhof, one of the troika of three uh, people who found the Red Army faction. Uh, she will um, be among the many who later have much closer relations with the German uh, East German regime. Uh, and in fact, uh, there's quite a list of members of the Bader Meinhof RAF uh, who did time uh, behind the Iron Curtain uh, for various reasons and purposes. Uh, in, the, in that way, they would, in, they would be meeting uh, other East Bloc officials and, uh, and, and members uh, of secret services who could help them in their foreign enterprises, uh, both European and Middle Eastern. Uh, among the more interesting guys who could be found in Berlin uh, in, for example, 78 and 79, was a man uh, named Mohammed Ode, uh, who, who is better known as Abu Daud, one of the masters of the, the Black September terrorist organization that ripped up Munich in, in 1972. So we have him then seven years after that tragedy, um, was spending weeks at a time in East Bloc places. Uh, also, one could find there from time to time uh, the legendary Venezuelan, uh, Carlos, uh, Illich Ramirez Sanchez was there uh, repeatedly. Uh, and he was, of course, uh, uh, had been at, at Patrice Lumumba University. On the Italian side, influence at the time and its direct links to violence is probably best embodied by Gian Giacomo Feltrinelli. You would know the name of the press in Italy, Feltrinelli. Uh, he was the heir to that fortune and publishing house and made uh, millions at it. He was an overt communist and by some accounts uh, definitely an agent. The point was that he was a successful Italian businessman and an activist and a militant and an intimate of, of Fidel Castro and uh, kept a safe house in Prague and went there repeatedly as we know from looking at uh, uh, the passport stamps in one of his uh, false passports. Gian Giacomo Feltrinelli was the editor of an Italian magazine called La Sinistre, and he also uh, was the editor for the, or at least the financier, for the Italian edition of Tricontinental, the, the famous Cuban magazine which exhorted everyone to join in the international fighting that uh, was going on. Um, there's a lot of evidence about this, uh, this fellow Feltrinelli by, for example, a wonderful uh, old Mar American Roman scholar, uh, Vittorio uh, Franco Pisano, uh, who's still writing in Rome and used to be a fixture of this town and, and worked for our Library of Congress. Uh, it's interesting to th think about then the connections some of the Italians did have uh, to the bloc. Uh, there, are, there are diverse, and one or two Italian communists were working, for example, for Czech state media. Um, James Dozier, the American general, was kidnapped and held in Padua for weeks at a time by the Red Brigades. Uh, one learned later that some of the questions supplied to him during the interrogation had come, in fact, from the Bulgarian Secret Service. Uh, two officials, uh, one a trade union official and another Italian, so Luigi and Loris uh, Scricciolo were those per uh, per per persons. Um, so there's a record then of East Bloc contacts that's growing, and of course you all know the story of the uh, Pope John II uh, plot, I think. It it's interesting that when he was grabbed in St. Peter's Square on that day in May 1981, uh, his pocket litter included telephone numbers to the Bulgarian embassy. All this has been written up in detail by people like uh, Paul Henze, the, the fine scholar who was at RAND for decades. Bulgaria also happened to be directly involved in the assassination of Georgi Markov and the attempt against another man at the same time. The key there was those people worked for media. So these were so-called wet operations uh, directly linked to the influence on opinion that things like Radio Free Europe and, and Radio Liberty and Voice of America were having. 
Um, so other state entities of the Soviet bloc were, uh, were involved, um, and uh, the, one of the most recent, uh, 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 in fact, examples of, of all the evidence that there is to study is the memoirs of Judge uh, Jean-Louis Bruguiere, a French investigative journalist who published his memoirs just in 2009, talks a lot about Poland and East Germany and other operations within terrorism in France. So there's a, then a, a strong record, we can say, uh, of a Soviet overt policy, the covert documents, and actual kind of police forensics, which come together to show us there was a enterprise. It was meant to do violence, and it was meant to change opinion in the doing of that violence. Terrific. Thank you so much, uh, Chris. Um, a, uh, a further refinement of the lens. And now Jack Zach and Tiak will take us even deeper into Soviet tradecraft and how it was passed on. Thank you. Let me add my welcome to the group. And uh, just by way of a little bit of clarification, over the last several years, I've been working on um, uh, issues of Soviet and Russian deception as part of the Soviet counterintelligence tradition, the counterintelligence state tradition. Deception, active measures, influence operations, provocation, provocatia, as the uh, Soviets and the East Europeans would say, uh, have been part of that tradition. And in fact, when we look more deeply at that Soviet tradition, we find that it's suffused with the idea of counterintelligence. Now, what I plan to do this morning, and in, even though we, we did not have a chance to caucus before, I think you'll notice that everything we say blends in to build a larger mosaic. So I will give you my contribution to that mosaic and see if we can get a, a little more coherent picture of Soviet influence deception operations and how that influenced the problem we're facing today with militant Islam. Okay, so. Bear with me and I'll, I'll march through a combination of, of historical pedigree on this as well as some contemporary uh, operational issues. Now, when overt Nazi influence in the Islamic world ebbed after Germany's defeat, the Soviet Union jumped in, Soviet Union and Warsaw Pact. I want to stress the Warsaw Pact because these people believed in a socialist division of labor. And they divided up the world, divided up activity, and uh, everybody answered back to KGB headquarters in Moscow. Uh, Moscow jumped in. They did a volt fast, complete about face. Remember, they were supporting Israel. They supported and voted for the creation of the Israeli state in 1948 and supplied Israel with military equipment. Did a 180. So uh, uh, we, we cannot detail the specifics of Soviet military and political uh, support, which lasted beyond the collapse of communism. But what I plan to do is briefly explore the influence of Soviet Warsaw Pact intelligence services and their contributions to an already established deception style uh, in Islamic traditions as exemplified uh, by such terms as takia, uh, kitman, uh, koda, uh, tarof, tanfi, and a good Latin term, tu quoque, uh, and to you also. Uh, very, used very, very effectively in their polemics uh, against the United States, and we see it being used uh, very effectively among, uh, in their influence operations actually in the U.S. government. Now, the Soviet intelligence and security services, uh, the counterintelligence state, were always at the leading edge of Soviet penetration or aid effort in the third world, uh, an operational style which simply replicated the way Moscow uh, injected its presence and interest into East Europe at the end of World War II, and indeed the way it carried out clandestine efforts to spread its revolutionary influence around the world following the 1917 Bolshevik Revolution. They did it right away, almost immediately. In fact, the very first things the Soviets did after they came to power in November of 1917 was run several massive deception operations. Uh, the first, one of the most critical ones of which was the, the famous trust, which if we had time in the Q&A, we can go into a little bit. Uh, the organs, as they were known in Soviet parlance, were the party's instrument of choice. Uh, the KGB was known as the action arm of the party. Okay, it was the party arm. And uh, now we have a KGB state without the party ideology justifying it. 
Very interesting situation the way this morphed. Uh, this continued into the last days of the USSR uh, and then carried over into the practices of the current Russian Federation uh, under Putin, uh, the KGB and the GRU uh, being followed by the FSB, SVR, and a still the old GRU, Soviet mil Russian military intelligence. Uh, wherever the organs went in the cutting edge of Soviet presence overseas was always the organs, always the KGB and the GRU, and in the, the alphabet soup after the Soviet Union collapsed, still the same thing. Uh, the Soviet Union was a counterintelligence state. That is uh, an enterprise in which the premier function uh, of the Communist Party and its ruling cadres uh, was the perpetuation of their power. Okay? Now that's an interesting piece of heritage to pass on to your clients, isn't it? And, and when you look at the imprint that the KGB made around the third world, you will find that there are replications of it performing the same function as we see in Syria today uh, of preserving a minority in power, one of the principal uh, focuses of the KGB. So from the very first day uh, uh, of the USSR, the intelligence services, they, they, as they were mistakenly labeled in the US, they're really the counterintelligence services, were imbued with a counterintelligence character, uh, as was the whole of the state and society. It's a counterintelligence state. Uh, foreign intelligence looked like external counterintelligence. Uh, just a, a, a quick excursion on the side. Uh, some years ago, back in the late 90s, I was working on an interagency group, both government and private, on Russian organized crime. It was part of a larger effort on international organized crime. On our working group, we had some members of the FBI. And uh, uh, they were having a hard time getting a handle on recognizing the characteristics of organized crime, especially working with foreign governments on it. And then at one of the meetings that we had, our FBI rep, our senior FBI rep, came in and he said, you know, I think we broke the code. We were looking at it the wrong way. When I look back at all the data that we had on these guys, we were looking at intelligence and counterintelligence operations. And my response was, bingo, you broke the code. That's it. So the Bolshevik regime was a conspiracy come to power. Uh, it, the Soviet Union, in practice, was a 71-year-old counterintelligence operation raised to the level of a state system. Uh, the party and the secret police operated in a conspiratorial amalgam. Now, organic to such counterintelligence uh, operations is the widespread practice of provocation, diversion, deception, disinformation, Moskidovka, the military application of, of deception, military, military focused deception, penetration, and other active measures of a highly aggressive uh, character. Uh, from the first days of the Bolshevik regime, these aggressive operations were conducted on a truly strategic scale. Uh, they may look tactical or operationally oriented in their application, but they are following a strategic script. They had objectives. They knew what they were after. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, one of the first integrated strategic deception operations was a trust. I, again, as a little aside, I had the good fortune in the late 60s after I retired to travel with a couple of uh, former intelligence friends to the former Soviet Union and we had some connections with the KGB, and we got a private tour of the KGB museum, and which is basically a counterintelligence museum. The very first thing that hit me as I walked in was an organization chart of the trust. They still teach that in their intelligence schools. And then as I went down the row of the different displays, my eye caught a display on the uh, Soviet espionage, atomic espionage networks in the United States, and I'm looking at it, all of a sudden my eyes pop because there's a picture of J. Robert Oppenheimer. And my Soviet host came up to me and put his arm around me and he says, come Jack, I've got more important things to show you. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 I want to read this. And my Russian was a little rusty and I'm reading that. And, and they wouldn't let me take a camera and otherwise I could have had the proof of it. And no Jack, and very assertively, he pulled me away. He wanted me to see that. And then he looked at me and he said, he was not agent. He was not agent. He was not agent. I see you're right. <laughs> okay, so an institutional mechanism for orchestrating this was the Disinformation Bureau, which they set up as early as 1923 by a Politburo directive. This came directly out of the senior leadership. And 
Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I apologize, folks. Uh, so right down to the present day, you still have vested in the Soviet, uh, the Russian security organs, I still have to retrain my tongue, uh, in the Russian security organs, in each of them, in fact, a deception element that works on the broader direction for coordinating strategic deception, influence operations, active measures, penetration, provocation, et cetera, et cetera. By the way, one of the, the really critical terms which we in the West tend to uh, overlook, and it's really understood in Central Europe and throughout the old territory of the old Soviet Union, is uh, provocation, provocatia. That's more or less a generic term that covers so much of the kinds of things we're talking about here. Now, when the Soviets monitor thrust into the Third World in the 1950s, uh, following World War II, the security organs were dominated, uh, were dominant with the KGB in the lead, but it included uh, the GRU as well. And they moved out. Uh, they, for instance, we forget that Sadat was one of, or Egypt was one of their principal clients under Nasser. Uh, Sadat threw them out. But they established long-lasting roots in Yemen, Syria, Libya, Iraq, Algeria, and others. And the others included not just nation states or rogue states, but such groups as the PLO, the PLFP, the Bosque ETA, and so forth. And these guys were very Catholic with a small c in their, their scope of operations. Um, and then they supplemented this, as my colleagues mentioned, with support from Eastern European services. Uh, again, on, on one of my trips behind the old Iron Curtain in the dark days of the Cold War in the 1970s, I happened to be in uh, beautiful downtown Bucharest. And I was working with the attaches, which are run by DIA, and I retired from DIA. Uh, and I was warned, don't go down to a certain area of central Bucharest. It's not too safe, not too healthy. And I said, why? Well, just don't go down there. Well, I went down there and driving around in a car, and lo and behold, what did I see? But a PLO office in a storefront. And these guys were carrying weapons. They were slung with AK-47s. Okay, so they occupied a special position. Uh, in this socialist division of labor under the Romanians. Okay, this was uh, Ceausescu's job. Okay, he had to take care of Yasser Arafat. And in fact, as Chris mentioned earlier in one of those photographs, in one of the photographs of Yasser Arafat in Moscow where he's laying a wreath at the, uh, the base of the Kremlin Wall at the eternal flame of the unknown soldier, uh, uh, his case officer was there with him. The photo appeared in the Washington Post. Most people hadn't a clue that there was his case officer from the KGB, a man by the name of Samoyenko, who was running him. And so he was a controlled asset of the KGB. Uh, so well, let me move on. I've been told I'm running way over time. Now, as Arab nationalists and pan-Arab dreams died in the repeated failures uh, in the multiple uh, Arab-Israeli wars and a collapse of their main patron, the USSR, uh, you know, militant Islam picked up the march. All of these people that the Soviets trained, uh, the, the training, the techniques, the tradition, the penetration of the services morphed into what we see today. Continued in many of the nation states. Uh, penetration of Libya went on for a long time, and as we're finding out, Using Soviet techniques, Moskudovka techniques, we didn't know anything about those uh, armed chemical warheads that they're finding in the southern Libyan deserts today, just recently, I should say. So resurgent militant Islam's encounter with the 20th century's two violent totalitarian ideologies produced a troubling legacy. Uh, one, one quick observation uh, along these lines. With Nazi Germany, we imposed, we, the Western allies, victorious allies, imposed a very strict denazification policy. Okay. We rooted it out down to the deepest levels. Textbooks, cleaning up textbooks, etc. That never happened in the Soviet Union. There never was a decommunization. It's been tried in several East European countries where they're going through illustration processes some successful, some not so. It's loaded with all kind of, of uh, unforeseen problems and implications. 
uh, but it's never happened. So the, the client states that the Soviets had worked with you know, were never the recipients of the type of thing, the psychological effect of a decommunization as we had seen with denazification in the Soviet Union. Okay, so let me try to quickly summarize here, make a few uh, summary points. Now, it's not that the jihadists today or militant Islam is so, are so deviously adept at their brand of, of strategic and tactical deception. Um, one of the problems we have is that we in the U.S. may be exhibiting some of the same symptoms as Stalin, i.e. denial and self-deception. Remember Stalin, the arch deceiver, the arch deceiver was deceived by a, you know, a penny any deception, group penny any deception operations by uh, Hitler prior to the invasion of the Soviet Union. Uh, the issue was that Stalin wouldn't believe it. Okay. I debriefed uh, one of the principal intelligence officers who warned Stalin, and Stalin would not listen, and he had to basically defect. Okay, now the consensus that uh, we had in the United States about identifying who the enemy was during the Cold War did not survive the Soviet collapse. Yet in some ways, the threat is even more insidious, more unpredictable, and just as dangerous. The U.S. did not face an internal counterintelligence problem caused by a large and radicalized Soviet emigration in the United States. Uh, given the nature of militant Islamic proselytism and the examples of the same in England, Spain, Germany, and most of the rest of Europe, uh, the insider issue in the U.S. takes on an immediacy we are not prepared to admit. In that regard, deception in the Islamic tradition uh, Takiya, Kitman, Koda, Tukokwe becomes a problem not only for national level authorities, but there's a dimension here that many of us miss. We must also now expect our local counterintelligence and security authorities and local employers to exercise the kind of sophisticated counterintelligence analysis and judgment formally expected only of national level intelligence and counterintelligence entities. We have a lot of work to catch up on the substance of deception issuing from militant Islam. But equally important, we need to overcome a self-imposed witless political censorship that shrinks from recognizing unpleasant realities. Okay. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to expand on any of this. Jack, thank you very much. That was uh, uh, a terrific uh, summation of, uh, of a really superb panel. Um, I'd, before opening it up, I'd like to just ask, um, if I may, each of you to speak to a, a, a real-time challenge that uh, has arisen in just the space of the past few weeks, as I recall. Um, looked at both, if you would, with sort of your historical uh, experience and, and what you make of it today. And that is the... Uh, direction from the Department of Homeland Security uh, that we now must, uh, under new guidelines promulgated by the department in connection with um, combating violent extremism, the approved euphemism for dealing with what you've called uh, militant Islam, Jack, I think. All such training must be run past what are known as community leaders, uh, both with respect to the individuals doing the training and the materials used in the training, um, so as to ensure, evidently, that um, these individuals and documents do not give offense to the communities involved and, uh, and presumably otherwise conform to their narrative. And uh, let me just stipulate for the purposes of the dis discussion that uh, as best I can tell, without exception, the community leaders that are being so empowered are in fact associated with, if not directly, involved in the Muslim Brotherhood. 
So if I could just ask each of the three of you to say a word about, um, you know, what might have been, say, the outcome of the Cold War had we adopted a similar approach to the KGB or the GRU doing our training in counterintelligence or similar activities, and uh, what you might say as to the advisability of this practice today. John. Thank you, Frank. Um, what's going on in the Islamic community, uh, both in this country and, and around the world, is a conflict that's not dissimilar to that which was going on during the labor movement during the uh, middle decades of the of the 20th century. Um, the the Communist Party was attempting to penetrate the labor movement and very much succeeded in doing so to the extent that such a prominent union as the Congress of Industrial Organizations the, the CIO part of AFL-CIO was actually uh, seized by, uh, the control of that union was seized by the communists. And what happened during the middle, those middle decades was a, a Herculean struggle of the free trade unionists who wanted to maintain uh, the, the free enterprise system and freedom of association amongst workers to, to uh, rid themselves of the association with the communists. Um, and it was because of the, the free trade unionists' experience with uh, struggling over the control of their, uh, of their unions with the communists that turned the, the labor unions in this country, at least for quite a, a number of years, into the most powerful and, and militant anti-communist organizations in the United States. It's, this is where Ronald Reagan cut his teeth uh, from experience in dealing with communists in, 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 in the trade unions in, uh, in, 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 uh, in Hollywood. Um, this, uh, uh, there is in some places in the world a struggle going on like this, for example in Indonesia where um, politically moderate Muslim organizations that are principally Sufi and that want their uh, religion to be a religion rather than a radical political ideology uh, have been fighting the, the, the politicized Islamists and, uh, and have been remarkably successful at doing so. The problem is that we're not seeing this type of a struggle at least uh, to the extent that <clears throat> it has become visible uh, in any meaningful sense within the West, although I think it is going on. The, uh, we, we see, for example, the spectacle of, uh, and it was, it was reported on the front page of the Washington Post a couple of months ago, a major story about a guy, uh, a Somali-American Muslim in Minneapolis who is trying to fight the radicalization process of young Somalis uh, who are watching, uh, uh, you know, uh, Al-Shabaab uh, uh, websites and then going over to Somalia to join the, the, the Al-Shabaab extremists over there. And, um, and here's a guy vainly fighting uh, to prevent this radicalization process with absolutely no support from the U.S. government uh, or from the state government uh, because apparently we're in a war of ideas with no warriors in this war and with no, uh, with no funding for this dimension of the war, which I consider to be the absolutely most critical dimension of the war, because you can take out your shotguns and start shooting mosquitoes all day long, but there's a fever swamp down there where a political, the political process of the recruitment of new mosquitoes is happening, and nothing is being done. There, there is no DDT, uh, ideological DDT. And, and, and so the whole world is getting m malaria. And, 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 uh, and th so this is, this, is, this is a huge problem of, of, of intellectual disarmament. And by the way, there's a, there's a Somali web, there's, excuse me, there's a Somali uh, American uh, radio station in Minneapolis that wants to have content to fight uh, Islamist extremism. And, uh, uh, and, and it wants to get, there is a place where such content exists. It's at the Voice of America's so Somali service. But the Smith-Munt Act 
prevents the Voice of America from sharing this with the Somali uh, American uh, station and so all of this goes on and the result is that when, when the, the, the moderate, politically moderate forces who want Islam to be a religion rather than a radical political ideology are utterly disarmed and get absolutely no support from the United States government, you're going to have the penetration of these, uh, these places and they will take over the way they took over the unions in, in the 1930s uh, and, and, and uh, we will suffer the consequences. John, thank you. Chris? The uh, White House documents of uh, this year uh, include a national counterterrorism follow-on short paper um, about uh, combating violent extremism. And I think both uh, talk a good deal about the need for better engagement struggle with the, with the Islamist fringe that support terrorism. Uh, but I think neither document is very good at being concrete about its recommendations. The one uh, major uh, strength of it would appear to be close liaison with governments, uh, with community leaders, but unless good discretion is shown about what community leaders are consulted, that could go south rather than help us. Uh, so there is, I think, too much talk in the last decade about a kind of struggle with the ideas behind uh, current terrorism and very little uh, conversation of seriousness, very little political warfare uh, about really contesting those ideas. We need much more of the latter. And just as I pass the mic off, I would say very quickly, uh, as, as to, to be positive, I, I strongly recommend much better amplification of those documents which come out of Islam, not Islamism, uh, which take a proper and reasonable attitude about terrorist violence and which vehemently denounce it. These, are, these documents emerge frequently uh, from councils of clerics and so forth, and they're usually ignored in our media and by our academics. And we could amplify those as from the State Department or even from the White House. Well, we could welcome those kinds of ideas and announcements. You will hear some say that will discredit them. I strongly disagree with that. And the argument that we should just let them appear and disappear is an example of why, as John says, we're not fighting. We talk about this as a struggle, but we're not fighting. Um, the second thing I would strongly recommend is better use of the outstanding, intelligent defectors from these kinds of movements. They have street credibility. They live in places like the Quilliam Foundation in London. They're highly articulate, compelling speakers, and they understand the insides of this movement and why it's such a vile movement for the future of democratic societies. Thank you, Chris. Um, I would just add, even though I'm a private citizen now, as a, an independent consultant, I do a lot of work on the inside. Uh, I'm an adjunct professor at the National Intelligence University and I've been seeing some indications of pressure coming down from points north uh, on the terminology to be used, etc. Although I will say that at the working level, the people I'm working with are very resistant to that. Um, to get an analogy from the Cold War and World War II, if we're going to bring in uh, advisors from the quote, community, unquote, presuming the Islamic community, uh, we're going to have to do a better job than just going to those people that have associations with the Muslim Brotherhood. And uh, the analog to World War II would be <laughs> going to the German-American Bund uh, for assistance in fighting Nazism, or in the Cold War going to the various communist front groups for assistance in fighting Soviet uh, active measures operations. You know, that's completely, you know, we're talking about cognitive dissonance here. And as I tell my students, both in the private realm and in, in government, especially with the ones I work with in government, they're all intelligence officers. And I say, look, as one intelligence officer talking to new budding intelligence officers, uh, integrity is a big thing, and honesty. Speak the truth. Teach it veritatem. Speak the truth. 
If you're going to fold every time there's a little bit of pressure that comes down from the politicians, then all you're going to be is a cipher. You're not going to be a good intelligence officer. Right? You, you, you have responsibilities as a professional. Exercise them. Um, questions? Please identify yourself. Thanks very much. C can you comment on how Please identify yourself. Michael Waller, Institute of World Politics and the Center for Security Policy. Uh, how, how operationally the KGB and the other organs used religious people, groups, clerics, seminaries, and so forth for their own purposes, how they infiltrated them, how they trained members of the clergy and theologians, and, and how they, as an atheist society, used this as a means of exporting either their ideology or their hate, both on a historic level all the way up to the very end, uh, the end being how many of those Soviet agents might even be some of these clerics uh, or, or, or theoretical leaders who are sponsoring the violence. John? Um, okay, let me just begin by saying that uh, I once asked Stan Levchenko, the KGB defector who was in charge of uh, Soviet active measures operations in, in, in uh, Tokyo, uh, who was the most important agent of influence in the entire pantheon of, of Soviet agents of influence. And without blinking an eye, he, he said, Metropolitan Filaret of Minsk, uh, one of the bishops of the Russian Orthodox Church. And the, 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 the atheistic Soviet Union had three Christian front organizations, one of the most notorious of which was the Christian Peace Conference, which uh, was uh, having big conferences with all sorts of religious figures all around the world uh, in order to rope them into Soviet peace propaganda. They uh, recruited uh, the KGB recruited all sorts of people to penetrate the Russian Orthodox Church. They sent them to seminaries in order to become Orthodox clerics. Uh, they made a special point of recruiting pedophiles in order that they should go and start molesting kids uh, and, and adolescents in, in, in in, uh, you know, in, in those working parishes which, which were still uh, operating in order to discredit the church, um, they, uh, they, they ultimately got it to the point where they were, where, where, the, where the, 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 the Kremlin was picking who the patriarch himself was. Uh, it started uh, with Patriarch Pimen who lobbied for the job by suggesting that perhaps the best thing that the Kremlin could do with the Russian Orthodox Church was to um, uh, actually collect the monies that were given by the local parishes to their pastors uh, and instead have all that money go through the Council for Religious Affairs and skim off a whole ton of it before sending it back to the parishes for basic operations. And they collected somewhere around a hundred million dollars a year of, of money in, uh, along those lines, which all get, got fed into Soviet peace propaganda and the funding of these, these, uh, these uh, church organizations. Uh, I mean, front organizations. They, they did special, they used the Orthodox Church as a method of, uh, of, of, of um, diplomatic cultivation of foreign religious groups. And, uh, and, and that was a special political influence operation all unto itself. Anyway, this is a very long story. All of these are very long stories and we're getting appropriately long answers, but we are a little short on time. Um, Jack, if I could ask you to particularly uh, address the extent to which this kind of influence operation aimed at religious communities is going on now at the hands of the Islamists, picking up on where the Soviets left off. Yeah, John made a very good point. Um, and what they did with the Orthodox Church, they repeated in their penetration of the Catholic Church. Uh, as well, going back to the 30s, 20s and the 30s, putting people into the seminaries and then running them up through, in the case of one, a Jesuit priest who became an advisor to uh, a secretary to uh, Paul VI. I'm not demeaning Paul VI. What I'm saying is this was a very, very 
beautiful operation, beautiful from a professional perspective. On the Islamic side, one of the things we tend to forget, the Soviets had a long experience with Islam on their own territory, Central Asia. Remember, they ran a counterinsurgency operation from the 1920s all the way up to the years before World War II in Central Asia, in what, is, what are now the Stans. Uh, and they were fighting, they labeled them the Basmachi, uh, a derisive term meaning gangsters or brigands, okay, brigands. But in, in fighting that, they had a very adept program of penetrating uh, the, well, you don't have a hierarchy in Islam the way you do in, in the Catholic Church and in the Orthodox Church and in, in certain Protestant groups. Uh, so they didn't have a hierarchy, but they, they knew how to penetrate these groups anyway, getting the imams. Okay, they got the imams, and they focused on a national identity as against the pan-Islamic identification. And so they were able, in addition to a counterinsurgency operation that was one of the most bloody in history and gets very, very little take, uh, they were able to pacify that region and keep it controlled right down to the collapse of the Soviet Union so that the cadres you see running the stands are a, an end product of that, the local cadres, even though they're nominally Islamic, uh, they're largely secularized too, but they penetrated the imams. And they had no problem doing this in working with the um, uh, rogue states, the rogue Islamic states, uh, Syria, uh, they worked with Yemen, recall, and then parceling this out among their fellow uh, intelligence services from Eastern Europe. But they worked the, the imam angle as well. They knew how to bring that in. Now, Helping them do this, and I, I not really had the time to explore what happened to that capability. For decades, the Soviets had a very, very, very good academic research capability that was an adjunct to the KGB, basically, in their various academies of sciences. Uh, and uh, they had some very good students of Islam in its various flavors and in its various nationalities. I have seen very little on what happened to that, but I would venture to say that the KGB is fairly well advised. And one last word, if you look at the principals who were involved in the period immediately after the collapse of the Soviet Union, in, in the Foreign Intelligence Service especially, you find, like Primakov, that they had a Middle Eastern background. Okay. It's very interesting, keep that in mind. And then Primakov's successor as well, whose name escapes me at the moment, uh, in the KGB, or the, the uh, SVR. Jack, just to, could ask you just to take another second there to address how you see the Islamists in places like the United States and elsewhere in the West going after non-Muslim religious communities as targets of their influence operation, targets of the stealth jihad, if you would. Um, again, I don't mean to link everything back up to the Soviet Union and the contemporary Russian Federation. But that long pedigree of close-up influence combined with the 1,400-year experience of Islam itself in using various stratagems, especially among the Shia against the majority Sunni, there is that, that, that natural capability with the overlay that they had gotten over the years through the intelligence service connection and the various front organizations that uh, permeated the, uh, uh, the third world. Uh, we saw back in the 80s how uh, media placements were very, very successful in ballooning, uh, expanding exponentially the Soviet message through third world outlets. I think they're doing the same thing. They have done the same thing. It's become internalized. If you look at the operations, for instance, of Al Jazeera, you could see some parallels to uh, Soviet uh, press operations during the Cold War. Now this carries on the, the idea of, of uh, influence operations, not only state to state, but at the local level. I would think that this, this can apply in their operations in tapping into community sentiments. Uh, and you find programs like we're seeing on television today um, uh, fostering a, a different kind of Islam than most Americans are familiar with. Sebastian. Sebastian Gorker, NDU and IWP. 
Um, first, if I may respond to what you said, Frank, the, the DHS guidance is, is even, um, there's something much more troubling than that, and that's the White House directive to the Department of Justice and the Department of Defense that all training on counterterrorism will be reviewed by an anonymous committee, which has already led to the blackballing of actual federal counterterrorism agents in their capacity to lecture their own cadre about the threat doctrine of the enemy. Uh, this, is, this is more Soviet than what we've been talking about the Soviet Union was. Uh, for those who are concerned about what the White House is doing with regards to our capacity to understand the enemy, please uh, contact Sue Myrick's office. She is already writing a letter to her fellow uh, congressman uh, saying that there has to be transparency. Who is doing the reviews? Why is there no appeal process? And uh, who actually has proven that the training that is currently done is biased in any way, shape, or form? Um, my, my question uh, to the panel would be, uh, the analogy breaks down at a certain level because the Muslim Brotherhood is not the KGB, the Muslim Brotherhood is not the GRU. So from the strategic point of view, how much harder or easier is the current conflict because it is not a nation state we are facing, there's no capital city or politburo for the jihadists. Um, wh what do we have to do differently with regards to this ideological war than when we were actually fighting one nation state that was an ideological enemy? Great question. Who would like to take that on? John? Um, Sebastian, it's an excellent question. I think that one of the central, there, there are two central problems, and that is the, the lack of of, of understanding of the enemy is one, which is a huge intellectual problem which is affected by willful blindness and by strategic deception. And, and you know, uh, Jack has mentioned strategic deception in a number of different ways. I just wanted to review, during the Cold War, the principal strategic deception theme of the Soviet Union was, to put it bluntly, we are not communists anymore. And we, therefore, are not a threat. And there are all sorts of different ways of saying this. Uh, there are hawks and doves in the Kremlin, for example. That was one of the classic themes. Well, the, the, the general secretary of the party is always a dove. The hawks are the mean old communists. They're in the back room. You've got to do a deal with the dove who's in charge and, 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 and help support him in power, or else the mean old hawks will come to power, and then it'll be curtains. Uh, the, the, um, there are many other variations of this kind of thing. This is an, an analogous strategic deception theme of the Islamism, uh, and uh, that, that we are really not the threat, that we are just uh, the religion of peace and so on and so forth, and, and, and conflating the radical political ideology with that part of Islam that is a genuine religion. The, 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 uh, the big problem impeding us is, in, in, in addition to the willful blindness and, and, the, and the lack of intellectual understanding of all of this, is the, the First Amendment problem. And this is where people will not touch this because it gets into the realm of religion and they think it is a violation of the First Amendment. The Special Operations Command will not touch this when it comes to uh, political influence operations that the armed forces might do. The armed forces are perhaps more clued into the necessity of doing this than anybody else, but they won't touch it. Uh, the, the, the State Department won't touch it. Uh, the CIA, God knows, they probably won't touch it. Uh, I, I would like somebody to show me that they're even thinking about this over at CIA. Uh, if Todd Leventhal is here. This is a mag he's part of the, the, the most revolutionary thing that has happened in the war of ideas since this whole thing started over a decade ago, um, this Strategic Counterterrorism Communications Office, but it has a rip-roaring nine people. Todd used to be the only guy doing, do, doing counter-propaganda and counter-active measures in the, in the entire Department of State, and, and, and he had no budget and no staff. And, and now, well, now there are nine of them. I think there ought to be probably around 2,000 of them instead of nine. And, and why shouldn't they be funded at a level that, com that comports with strategic need? And by the way, the First Amendment problem should not be a problem because 
We used to do religious programming over Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, and Radio Liberty. We used to do entire religious services, or Russian Orthodox services, run by Father Viktor Potapov, who runs the Russian parish up here off 16th Street. Solzhenitsyn would come to town and sleep on his couch, and he would give him, uh, you know, uh, you know, 200 proof, you know, 200 proof, uh, uh, you know, uh, Russian Orthodoxy over the Voice of America. This was no no established violation of the establishment clause uh, in, in 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 the First Amendment. We've got to sober up and get away from this incredible timorousness about these matters. Great, John. Yeah, let, let me just, if I may, add one. Uh, one detail is an example of, uh, of the magnitude of the problem with uh, the military. Uh, our colleague uh, in our Team B study on Sharia, the threat to America, uh, Diana West, has collected uh, examples of the Islamicization of the military, which uh, at the risk of being a little graphic, uh, includes uh, apparently now injunctions being passed on by some of the Afghan trainers we are relying upon in much the same way as we were just talking about here at home, um, enjoining Marines from urinating in the direction of Mecca or sleeping with their boots facing that direction lest it give offense. So I, I think this is uh, just symptomatic of the problem. Chris, Jack, do you like to say uh, that? That's a good question, Sebastian. And uh, um, However, I think the the experience that we had from the Cold War, even though ultimately we were dealing with a nation state, uh, the, the similarities are, are strikingly amazing between the ideological problem then and the ide basically political ideological problem today of militant Islam. Um, there was a lot of opposition within the federal government. If you left it to the bureaucracy, they would have done nothing. Todd back there knows well that it took a great deal of pressure from the outside, coming in from the Senate and from certain people inside the federal executive at the NSC level, uh, Ken Graffenried being one of them, uh, John another, and then a, a few people in the bureaucracy scattered around in the intelligence community in our case uh, who linked up with them, and we were able to get that, that in, but it does take a concerted effort from outside. It does take a lot of pressure from people outside. It, you cannot do it within the bureaucracy itself. Uh, but I, I really think that uh, the whole point of this particular exercise is to resuscitate the kind of experience, hard, now I think indisputable experience that we had during the Cold War, and make the dot connecting to what is going on today in two respects. One, that it's possible for influence operations to be run against open societies like ours with devastating effect. And two, the people who were past masters at it are to some extent still at it, we should also say, but also have helped bring a whole new generation with a whole new ideological uh, impetus to bear in much the same way. So, John? Well, thank you, Frank. Uh, Ginny, uh, I think uh, it's a very good question, and a large part of this lies, uh, the root of the problem lies in the fact that people, we are an ahistorical people, and uh, social history has completely substituted the study of diplomatic, political, military, and intellectual history in our universities, and this is uh, commensurate with a catastrophic decline in the study of history and the number of history majors, period. So the people remaining are those who uh, are studying, you know, what was it like to be a worker in the sweatshops of the robber barons in the 19th century and what an evil country America is. Okay, that's, that's what they study in college today to make a caricature of it, which is not entirely fair, but basically people don't know their history, they, don't, they, they, they know very little, and so therefore, you know, the, the Cold War, uh, the Nazis, the fascists, all of these totalitarian movements are, are unknown, and therefore the genetic code of how these people think and how they conduct their statecraft is unknown. And what is, what is so useful about this, and what I appreciate that, that Frank has put this thing together, 
is that we can share just you know the tip of an iceberg of of, of the knowledge about uh, about that genetic code and how it operates. And and by the way, there's a lot greater understanding actually of what totalitarian systems were like. And by the way, it's it's very useful. You know, our professor at IWP, Doug Doug Strusand, who also doubles as as a professor down at the Marine Corps University, has been trying to promote the notion of the term, well, this term, uh, totalitarian Islam or or Islamism, um, as a way of distinguishing the it, it's it's sort of political, structural, ideological, genetic code. But what is really not understood because there is still some understanding of this, is how to fight these kinds of things. How to do political warfare. How to do defense against political warfare. And by the way, the founding fathers of this country, George Washington and his farewell address, the founders who wrote the, 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 the Federalist Papers, in a number of different places talk about the Achilles heel of the Republican form of government. And that is what Washington described as the insidious, the, the unique vulnerability of the Republican form of government to the insidious wiles of foreign influence. And for, you know, with, except episodically, the United States government and the, our national security establishment has never taken this seriously. There is, today there are 25,000 Chinese spies in the United States, and, uh, and maybe that's a low estimate, and, and a large number of them are involved in influence activities, and there is essentially no defense against it. Okay, and, 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 and China is one of those places that, that similarly poses an existential threat to the United States. Anyway, the, the whole, how, there are ways of doing this. There are ways of combating. So. In fact, he has an entire master's degree program <laughs> devoted to this very subject, which is why we're delighted to showcase both John and, his, uh, and some of his team. Chris? Uh, if, if you're like me and can't get enough, uh, I do recommend a full spectrum diplomacy. Uh, I finished it a few weeks ago. Uh, from the Russia question and on to another government. That is, I could, I could, what I could add to what's been said is uh, there are current governments doing uh, remarkable cases of influence operations, which we can study now, which directly assist the terrorism projects of the Islamist uh, extreme fringe. And Iran is a central case. I mean, Syria is interesting, but Iran is the real center of it ideologically, which isn't self-evident because of their Shia affiliations, uh, but they've been able to aid both Sunni and Shia organizations, political, terrorist, and otherwise. And uh, those are very significant. So when we see, uh, you know, the st the st when we study the foreign policy of Iran, we can see overtly the desire to expand the realm of, uh, of Islam on earth, if you like, and to do this in many fighting ways. We can see that it's a semi-governmental foundation, the 15th Khordad Foundation, which uh, imposed the, uh, the, the, the bounty on novelist Salman Rushdie, uh, which eventually reached $2.5 million. It was effectively a kind of semi-governmental offer of two and a half mil to, to murder a novelist abroad. Um, we can see similar efforts on the part of states like Iran uh, to kill their emigres who are outspoken in Europe. That happens repeatedly in, 19, in the 1980s as the Iranian regime consolidates power. And to tend to extend it one more tendril, and then I'll, I'll hand this off, uh, here in South Florida at one of our universities, we had a couple of, of extremely interesting people. One was called Sami Amin al-Aryan, and there was Ramdan Abdullah Shalah. They were professors. And uh, we all know what power, especially over undergraduates, an academy can have. Uh, both of these men were teaching and raising money for centers and for academic programs and got quite a lot of attention to themselves as sort of professors of Middle East studies. But in fact, they were extreme radicals involved with a lot of very hostile people abroad and here at home. Um, one of them, Ramdan Abdullah Shaleh, 
uh, disappeared out of Tampa, Florida, and his university offices after the head of the Palestine Islamic Jihad was killed in 1995. And guess who the new general secretary of the PIJ is? It's the same man, Ramdan Abdullah Shalah. Uh, so he went immediately from the classroom into the directorship of one of the uglier Islamist organizations that's funded directly by Iran. So Iran's generosity with Hezbollah, Hamas, and the Palestine Islamic Jihad uh, could all be explored as a kind of state use of influence operations. Um, whether it's the partnership which Hezbollah now holds in the Lebanese government or academic things like these two men were doing at the University of South Florida. Jack? It was a good question, uh, Jenny. Uh, but this was basically level one of a multi-level process that would have to occur. Uh, and I don't think it's, it, it's wrong to look at the Soviet connection, the Soviet and the Russian connection, uh, I think we have to look at it from the perspective of the, the pedigree and the model that it has established, its pedigree and the model that has, it has established, because so many of these third world movements, as well as Islam, have looked to the Soviet model and they've internalized it. If you look at the structure of the intelligence and security services of these countries, well, modeled on the, on, on the Soviet model. Okay, so the Soviet model is basically a counterintelligence model. Counterintelligence model is going to be very adept at uh, grand deception, provocation, and so forth. Then the next level that we have to take it is to look at how they are using it to fit their own experiences in light of their own experiences and their own tribal, clan, and national uh, identity as well. Uh, so the, the seed that the Soviets planted is still there. And if you don't think it's still viable around the rest of the world, Look at the Occupy Wall Street crowd, okay? Uh, I'm serious about that. That's following that ideological model. Well, that is indeed a subject for another day. Um, we've kept you rather longer than uh, we promised, but I hope very profitably so. I'd just like to make one comment in closing and um, uh, hopefully titillate you with a coming attraction. Picking up on what Chris just said, Samuel Arian and Ramdan Shalav were running Palestinian Islamic Jihad, or at least parts of its operations, out of their professorships. Uh, it was for that reason that Sami, who didn't have the sense to flee, was convicted and served hard time in federal prison. Um, our next feature in this series is going to be a drill down on how it was that Sami al Arian got close to George W. Bush, both on the campaign trail in 2000 and in the White House. How he got him to accept his priority agenda item, which was a prohibition on the use of what Sammy called secret evidence, uh, a rather pejorative term for evidence that if turned over to, say, an illegal immigrant, awaiting deportation on suspicion of terrorism, like Samuel Arian's brother-in-law, could not only compromise that information, obviously, but could comp compromise the sources and methods by which it was obtained. Hence, in 1996, Congress authorizing the permission to withhold that information from such individuals. Samuel Arian had it as his top agenda item for years prohibiting such secret evidence. I think not only to ensure that his brother-in-law was not deported, but presumably to ensure that that evidence was not used against him. So if you are interested in hearing how it was that Samuel Arian and a number of other top Muslim Brotherhood and or Iranian Islamist operatives penetrated the Bush campaign penetrated the Bush White House, penetrated the conservative movement and Republican Party. We will be addressing that in our next series, uh, next uh, seminar of this series um, after Thanksgiving. And we will notice you, I hope, 
a little bit more promptly <laughs> so that you can make plans to participate. I want to thank um, our superb speakers for an extraordinary presentation. Also, I neglected to say this, but uh, I hope it was uh, understood from the beginning. Uh, my deepest appreciation to David Bob and the Hillsdale College, um, Larry Arn, among others, uh, who make this uh, room available to us. Um, and uh, to all of you, needless to say, for coming and staying and asking such thoughtful questions and hopefully taking away from it the kinds of important insights that will hopefully help determine whether we understand the enemy that we are currently confronting and the tradecraft that they are bringing to bear with devastating effect against us. Thank you very much. We are adjourned.